vowed to stand up for freedom and democracy. It came just hours after President Putin threatened to use nuclear weapons, warning he wasn't bluffing. He's calling up more than 300,000 military reservists to fight, which has sparked protests in cities across Russia. Five Brits captured whilst fighting alongside Ukrainians are among the ten foreign nationals freed by Russian-backed forces. Aidan Aslin, John Harding and Sean Pinner, along with two more unidentified UK citizens, had been held captive for months. They've been released as part of a prisoner swap brokered by Saudi Arabia. And a spectacular new image of Neptune has been released by NASA. The James Webb Space Telescope has captured the clearest view yet of the planet, seen for the first time in infrared light. It's the most comprehensive look at Neptune's rings in three decades. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News Now. It's back to the briefing with Tom Howard. Good morning, it's 9.34 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now, in the last 30 minutes, the government lifted the moratorium on shale gas extraction in England in what some are describing as a breach of their 2019 manifesto. But would it breach that manifesto? This is what the manifesto actually said, allowing fracking if the science shows categorically that it can be done safely. A crucial get-out clause written right there in the manifesto commitment that's been overlooked by most in this conversation. But fracking is not the only big news today. Of course, Liz Truss used her first speech on the world stage as Prime Minister last night to condemn Putin's nuclear threats as sabre-rattling. Here's what she had to say in New York. No one is threatening Russia. Yet as we meet here this evening, in Ukraine, barbarous weapons are being used to kill and maim people. Rape is being used as an instrument of war. Families are being torn apart. And this morning, we have seen Putin trying to justify his catastrophic failures. He's doubling down by sending even more reservists to a terrible fate. He's desperately trying to claim the mantle of democracy for a regime without human rights or freedoms. And he's making yet more bogus claims and sabre-rattling threats. This will not work. The international alliance is strong. And Ukraine... Well, Liz Truss there speaking in the very early hours of the morning in New York. She's flown back to the UK overnight for busy times in Westminster. Uh, but the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee is set to announce their latest decision on interest rates before all of that. Uh, on the cards could be the largest rate rise for over 30 years as the bank tries to curb inflation. The base rate is expected to increase by at least 0.5%, with some suggesting it could be raised by 0.75%. This, of course, a day before the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, prepares to spend potentially hundreds of billions of pounds on energy bills uh, and to reduce revenues in tax cuts in his mini-budget tomorrow. It's been criticised by some as what has been described as trickle-down economics. But what does that mean? Is it a fair criticism? And what can we expect tomorrow. Let's get stuck right in. I'm joined by Jonathan Porters, the former chief economist at the Treasury, and Andrew Lillico, the executive director at Europe Economics. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, let's start with you, Jonathan. Um, uh, what do you expect the overarching strategy of the Chancellor to be tomorrow morning? Um, well, I think it, it, it appears to be basically Reaganomics. Um, that is to say, um, cut taxes, don't worry too much about spending, um, and uh, assume that somehow at some point growth will help balance the budget. Um, whether that is a viable strategy at a time when interest rates and um, even more worryingly, uh, UK gilt yields are rising quite sharply and the pound is falling, um, I think is 
que question by me and, and, and a number of other observers. I think the point here is not so much the energy price package. That was in some sense politically inevitable. I think any government would have done much the same thing, to be honest, even though lots of economists like me don't much like it, but it, it was a necessity. Um, but the idea that, na that this is a, that, that permanent tax cuts, large permanent tax cuts with no prospect and no plan to put us on a fiscally sustainable path, as the IFS has just pointed out, the idea that that's a credible economic strategy um, seems rather questionable to me and I think to many observers. Well, let's put that to Andrew Lillico now. This idea that permanent tax cuts may not be the revenue raisers that the Chancellor perhaps expects, or at least that this is a bit of a gamble. Well, I don't know why tax cuts would be any more permanent than spending rises. Seeing you just they don't want to raise taxes for now. The policy appears to me to be, apart from the uh, the energy package, and I probably share some of Jonathan's uh, um, doubts about that, but also the political inevitability of it. Um, the apart from the energy package, uh, the tax measures which they're doing seem to me to be absolutely orthodox ordinary kind of approach to macroeconomic policy making uh, you have a recession you try to cut taxes or not to raise them as much in the face of the recession for all the, um, Liz Truss's claims to be engaging in some kind of breaking of uh, uh, treasury orthodoxy that just seems to me a very conventional approach to things and I'm not sure why it's discussed as being such a weird idea in terms of what happens over the longer term what she wants to do is to introduce various kinds of measures to make the economy grow faster but her, the tax measures which is introducing it here aren't going to be the ones that do that that's more about the various you know changes to planning rules or changes to the um, uh, attractiveness of the uk as a location for new technologies or those kinds of things it's um, a much broader agenda uh, the tax measures she's going to introduce aren't going to be ones that change the um, uh, change the long-term growth rates of the economy by themselves changes really importantly a little bit later in this conversation but just to the uh, question of whether or not this is conventional economics Jonathan Portis you described it as, as as Reaganomics earlier what do you say to Andrew Lillico's suggestion that cutting taxes at the time of recession is fairly conventional well I mean a large you know uh, letting the budget deficit widening and even taking discretionary measures to let temporary measures to let the budget deficit widen in the face of a recession is conventional but of course the energy price package does that and much much more this is in some sense a much larger fiscal loosening than we saw say in 2008-9 much much larger um but it is not, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not quite sure, sure where Andrew gets the idea that these aren't permanent cat cuts. If, if this trust is saying that, uh, say, the uh, cutting, the reversing the national insurance rise that she's planning to announce, that's only a temporary measure to stave off a recession, um, then uh, I will admit that he's right and I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure that's not what she's going to say. What the IFS and what every um, one who's looked at the numbers says is that the result of the large tax cuts, the changes, the, the reversing SUNAX rises in, in national insurance and corporate tax mean will be a large, very large budget deficit for the foreseeable future with no plan whatsoever to uh, return to a fiscally sustainable path. That's not about temporary measures during a recession to boost demand, where I think Andrew and I are broadly in agreement. It is saying we would like to, and remember, they are saying they'd like to balance the budget. They just have absolutely no plan for that. And that is not something that previous governments have done. And it certainly isn't, you know, it is against the Treasury orthodoxy mm. in the sense that um, for whatever you thought of them, uh, um, Brown, Osborne, Hammond, etc., at least said, look, this is our plan. Here are the measures that mm. broadly get us back towards a sustainable fiscal path. Um, and this government is simply, as I said, adopting the Reaganomics thing of saying, well, mm. we're going to cut taxes. And look, you know, as I said yesterday, um, Reagan famously said, um, I'm not worried about the budget deficit. It's big enough to look after itself. And that's essentially <laughs> the, uh, the Quartang Trust uh, line as well.
Well, I suppose the, the answer to that might be that we haven't had a, a, a budget surplus for more than two decades under a variety of chancellors, some who've said they wanted to eliminate the budget deficit and some who have been uh, less worried about it. None of them have succeeded. I suppose, Andrew Lillico, uh, is this new approach, this idea that actually perhaps the deficit right now in the short term doesn't matter so much and that our debt burden uh, is not as bad as some other comparable G7 countries. Uh, is this a big change and might it work? Well, there's a few things going on here, I think. One is that there's um, considerable uncertainty about the outlook, both in terms of uh, areas such as you know, how much does the energy package, is it actually going to cost? That's very contingent upon what happens to gas prices. So it's very difficult because it's very difficult to guess, even to within the many tens of billions as to how much it might cost in the end. It's very difficult then to schedule any tax measures or other spending cuts that would balance that off because you don't know what the target is that you're shooting at. Another thing is that the government is intending to introduce a set of measures, they haven't told us what they are, uh, but they have this aspiration of raising the long-term growth rate of the economy. And mm. it would be it would be counterproductive, potentially, to, set, uh, to at the same time as you're trying to introduce measures that make the economy grow faster, also to introduce uh, a programme that was based upon you failing to do that, of um, correcting the budget. But a third element here, which is quite different from those of the past couple of decades, is that we have high inflation. And the thing about high inflation is that, well, it's going to erode, tend to erode your public spending levels by itself, uh, but it's also going to erode your debt um, as a proportion of GDP. So it's a different kind of a situation that we face. It, and the, the correct um, fiscal principles to apply have to be flexible to the differences in the situation. Interestingly, Liz Truss said last night that she does want to get the UK's growth up to 2.5%. That seems to be a very explicit target of this government. It's something that could fund further tax cuts or indeed higher public spending. Um, just as a final question to the both of you, uh, Jonathan first, is it achievable? Um, it's going to be very difficult. Remember, Gordon Brown did almost exactly the same thing uh, and that didn't work out too well. It's not hard. You know, it's certainly achievable to set a target. Um, actually achieving it is quite a different matter. Um, and it will require action on a number of fronts. It will require in public and private investment. It will require action on education training. It will require improving physical and digital connectivity. It will require building more houses and some changes to the planning system. Remember, lots of all of those things I've said have been well known and have indeed various governments have tried to do them um, over the past 20 years um, and sad to say um, largely failed. Um, so uh, um, I think setting this as an aspiration um, and saying that you're going to set policy to try and get there is perfectly reasonable, as I said, far from uh, unusual. Um, the uh, um, you know, ma making your spending and tax decisions on that basis, I think, is is at best uh, a, a, a bit of a gamble. And in 30 seconds, if you would, same question to you, Andrew Lillico. Uh, I think it's reasonable to aspire that we should get the level of um, the GDP, annual GDP growth, back to what was typical from the period of the early 1980s until the late 2000s. Uh, I think that we've got ourselves in a kind of, um, we got ourselves stuck in a rut, and that it's reasonable to think that we might get ourselves out of that. In fact, the period of high inflation will do a little bit of that for us, for us by itself, and other international developments may also help. So it could actually be that Truss ends up looking quite good on this, even though the things she specifically did didn't make that much difference. Really, really interesting stuff there. Well, thank you both to Jonathan Portis and Andrew Lillico for that uh, detailed exploration of what's going on with the economic policy of this government. I suppose it's not long to wait to see what the Chancellor says tomorrow morning. Well, now moving on. Earlier, the Health Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister spoke to GB News Breakfast uh, about her new health policy. This is what she had to say. I'm covering in a variety of ways the things where patients rely most on uh, access to the NHS and that's actually through primary care and that's why I've set out a clear uh, expectation that when people phone up the surgery first of all they get through but also 
uh, that they also can get an appointment certainly within a fortnight and for urgent cases which many GPs are already brilliant at doing uh, getting that same day appointment so they can immediately get access to the care that they uh, desperately need. We've uh, had a national emergency with Covid and the NHS and care has got us through that uh, for people who are particularly vulnerable. That national emergency is still continuing and it necessitates a national endeavour and that's why we're working hard to extend some of the what we did in COVID to help uh, with uh, retire, uh, probably retired staff to come back into the NHS, uh, but also many other measures, which I'll be setting out in more detail to Parliament later today. Well, the Health Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister Therese Coffey there. Let's get some instant reaction from John McTernan, the former political secretary, to Tony Blair. John, thanks for joining us in the studio. I suppose this is a big gamble of the government, putting the NHS as something that they're trying to fix in one of their first big policy blitzes. Um, it's going to be a pretty tough winter, whatever happens. Well, we're... This is, in the summer, we had the equivalent of a winter crisis, all those ambulance queues outside hospitals. Um, in the winter, with the return of COVID, I imagine, but we'll have a winter crisis on a scale we've never seen before because the staffing issues, and I've heard the health secretary concede that, um, but saying that you'll have access to a GP within two weeks doesn't make it happen. And in fact, she's clarified it's an aspiration, but the public will hear it, then they'll try and get to see their GP. They won't get to see their GP in two weeks and they'll judge the government on the record because if you put energy to one side, the next biggest crisis in the UK is the NHS. And I think I've seen nothing yet from what Liz Truss or the Deputy Prime Minister have been saying that shows that they can tackle the issue and solve it. Yes, they know it's a problem, but so do we. So do the punters, so do the patients, so do the voters. What's the solution? And I've, I've not heard anything that suggests there's more staffing coming. There's mm. aspiration. It's all aspiration. Yes, yeah, so I suppose one of the things that was said was this continuation of the COVID-style approach to bring some people back into the workforce who've recently retired. Um, the, the health service is, is pretty well funded now. The NHS has more money per person than the OECD average, more than many comparable European countries. Why is it that we're not seeing the results of that investment in our outcomes? Uh, the, the, the spending on the National Health Service has not kept up with the increase uh, of the population of the UK. We've got a growing population. It's not kept up with the ageing of the population. We've got an ageing population. Uh, and nothing has been done to support social care, uh, to allow social care to take some people from hospitals and put them in a care setting. And that's the difficulty of this. Um, there has been a decade of, of falling investment in the health service, and that's showing it. Uh, there's been a period uh, of slowing migration of people, doctors, nurses coming from abroad. Mm -hmm. That's showing. Um, there are GP, there are I, I would challenge you on the, on the idea that there's less funding uh, per person in the NHS, because most... We're the fifth richest country in the world. We shouldn't be at the average of the OECD. We right. should be in the top part of the OECD, so this is, spending this is on health. Less relative to where you'd like it to be, rather than less in absolute terms. No, it's actually fall, it's fallen. In, it, it stayed real in ca it, stayed, it stayed constant in cash terms, uh, but it's fallen because the demands on it have been growing, because our population's mm. been growing. Um, and or or ageing, particularly. A, for, a, form, I... a former chief executive of the health service said uh, that the funding crisis can be seen from the moon. Um, it, it, this is a problem. There's a problem with doctors' pensions, which the, the government haven't, haven't solved. David Cameron and, and George Osborne created the problem with doctors' pensions. People are retiring early. You mm -hmm. can't get them back if you don't fix the pension problem the way it's fixed for judges. There's just a whole set of issues mm -hmm. which are actually to do with the, the satisfaction, to do with the payment, to do with the, the pension. The problem, though, underlying it is we don't have enough money going into the health service and we don't have enough money going into social care. And until there's actual resources, mm. uh, this will just be shifting, shifting things around the system. There's quite a lot of speculation on this question of social care. Yeah. This is something that has not yet been pre-briefed, but might be announced a little bit later today, this idea of, of trying to get people out of hospitals mm -hmm. and into social care mm -hmm. settings, freeing up spaces, potentially trying to alleviate the ambulance crisis that way. Is there's it possible? A, it is possible, and health and social care should be working together. But at the moment, um, all the extra money in the national insurance levy uh, that's meant for social care is going to the health service. 
Um, people in social care are skeptical that money will come to them mm. and they have their own staffing crisis. There's a competition going on for staff between hospitals and care homes. You need to have an integrated approach to staffing and I think everybody in the health service says let's see a staffing plan, we need a staffing plan for social care. It's the interrelations at a local level, at a regional level need to be worked through. Yes, more people could be in care homes but they need more staff, mm. they need fair funding, they need stable funding um, and a lot of the discussion around social care from the government so far has been how do we reduce the costs, not how do we improve the quality and increase the supply. Get more supply, get higher quality, then you can help the health crisis. Well, we'll be hearing from the Health Secretary in full a little later this morning. For now, John McTernan, Thanks. thank you for your time this morning. And just finally today, it's not just health, it's not just the economy, there's also social crisis in the United Kingdom as well. Our Home Affairs and Security Editor, Mark White, has been in Leicester to find out what's going on. On Belgrave Road in Leicester, the scene of so much of the violence in recent days, it's peaceful now. The predominantly Hindu community is preparing for the annual Diwali festival next month. But for now, locals like Rakan Chudasama, who's run a retail business here for 20 years, is more concerned about the next few days, fearing the possibility of renewed trouble here. It's minority who's causing the problem. I mean, Hindus and Muslims, end of the day, we are all one. So I don't, I don't see why they should be fighting. Last weekend's violence here stretched local policing resources beyond breaking point. Senior officers had to call on mutual aid from neighbouring forces to help bring order back to the community. The area's Police and Crime Commissioner says reinforcements will be in place in the days ahead, should trouble flare again. Some of the officers are beginning to get tired, you know, they're needing to take rests. But the neighbouring police forces have been absolutely wonderful. They have not stinted uh, in sending us additional officers, together with all the equipment that they need. So, yeah, absolutely, um, there will be enough police officers out there to cope with whatever comes. The violence here between young Hindu and Muslim men flared up after a cricket match between India and Pakistan on the 28th of August. Both sides, of course, blame each other and social media has only intensified the anger and unrest. The violence here is a huge blow to Leicester's reputation as one of the country's most ethnically diverse, yet largely harmonious communities. A city that has always proudly boasted of its multicultural heritage. Suleiman Nagdi from the Federation of Muslim Organisations in Leicester believes a recent surge in immigrants from the subcontinent has added to the volatility within settled and to an extent integrated communities here. In recent years, we've had a new migration that's come in over the last four or five years. Now, I don't wish to stereotype a particular section of the community. But that community came from a different background, and therefore their understanding and the norms of British society may be different to that of mine. And I think we have not built the bridge between that community and ourselves, and hence I think the problem lies at every section of society. Despite the calls for calm, it's clear that below the surface there are those prepared to exploit ancient animosities and import the kind of interfaith intolerance that has so divided much of the Indian subcontinent. Mark White, GB News, Leicester. And thank you, Mark, for that fascinating story. We'll be keeping a close eye on what's going on in Leicester and those community tensions as the weeks go on. Well, that's it for me today on The Briefing. Thank you for your company. Up next, it's To The Point with Anaya and Mercy. But first, here's the weather. Hello, good morning. I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. A wet start for some, northern areas in particular, but in the south it's mostly dry with some early mist and fog clearing to bright skies by this afternoon. High pressure is edging away into the near continents and uh, low pressure as well as weather fronts are affecting the north of the UK. Now this cold front that's crossing Scotland and Northern Ireland as we speak, well it pushes into Northern England and parts of North Wales later in the morning. So the rain arriving here and turning heavier as the day goes on, especially over the hills of Cumbria and North Wales. 
To the south of that, after any early mist clears, well, actually it's a bright afternoon for much of central and southern England, southeast Wales as well, 21 to 22 Celsius. But for Scotland and Northern Ireland, a damp start here, followed by brighter skies, especially towards the northwest during the afternoon, although the rain could linger for a time across southern Scotland. There will be some scatter showers into the northwest of Scotland, perhaps the north coast of Northern Ireland as well. And they fade away into the hours of darkness during Thursday night. Clear spells for much of the north and the west eventually. And as a result, temperatures dipping into the single figures. But it's a milder night for the rest of England as well as Wales with cloud and outbreaks of rain pushing southeast. So it's a damp start to the day for southeast England uh, on Friday morning. But actually that rain turns more showery. And for many, Friday is a showery day. But the showers fairly well scattered in many places sunny spells in between, although the far southeast could see some more prolonged rain at times because of the proximity of the weather front. A cooler day for many, temperatures up at around 16 degrees in the north, 19 or 20 in the south. Saturday is also a day of sunny spells and showers, again the odd heavy downpour in the south and the east. Sunday starts dry before rain and wind push south, followed by a colder airflow. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Good morning, this is To The Point on GB News with me, Anaya Flaren, Inman and Mercy Maroki on your TV, radio and online. We're with you until midday with a show jam-packed with the biggest stories, lots of discussions and expert guests, as well as our opinions and yours. Yes, lots to come uh, up in our show today and we'd love to hear your views as usual, so get them in at gbviews at gbnews.uk. We'll try and get to as many as we can throughout the programme, but first, here's your latest headlines. Good morning, it's one minute past ten. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Patients in England will be expected to get an appointment with their GP within two weeks under plans to be unveiled by the new Health Secretary this morning. Under the reforms, it's also expected to raise coffee. Will pledge patients will, with urgent needs will be seen on the same day. It's part of a drive to improve access to doctors' appointments as she unveils her NHS plan for this winter and next. One of the things that I want to do is to not be prescriptive with um, GPs uh, in how they interact with their patients, uh, but to make sure that those service levels or ex uh, expectations are met. And we want to work on a local NHS level uh, to make sure that those practices that aren't meeting 
uh, that expectation of uh, patients being able to see a GP within two weeks, how we can help them do that. Meanwhile, the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, told GB News an NHS workforce plan should be a top priority. Unless we recruit more doctors and nurses, unless there's a workforce plan for the NHS, there just isn't a plan for the NHS. And what really worries me is that this is our third health secretary in six months. And I've not seen any sign in the newspapers that she's planning to grip that particular issue. And unless we recruit those doctors and nurses, more people will leave the profession. That means longer waits, worse care, and I think people are sick and tired of waiting. The Bank of England is expected to unveil the biggest hike in interest rates for over three decades this morning. The Monetary Policy Committee is expected to increase rates by 0.75% to 2.5%. It would be the highest interest rate the UK has seen since the 2008 financial crisis. GB News' business and economic editor Liam Hannigan says homeowners will likely see a significant difference. This is bad news if you've got a variable rate mortgage. Far fewer houses are mortgaged than they were 20 years ago. A lot more houses are owned outright because so a lot of young people can't get on the housing ladder, obviously. And obviously, if you've got personal loans on variable rates, they will go up too. But spare a thought for Britain's army of savers who've been abused for decades now. A little bit of chink of hope for them. The government has lifted a plan, a ban on fracking in England in a bid to increase what it calls homegrown sources of energy. The Prime Minister insists it will stimulate more domestic gas supplies and has promised not to approve anything that carries risk amid concerns over earthquakes. A safety report by the British Geological Survey is due to be published later, with the government also expected to unveil how it plans to end the ban. A 16-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder in connection with the death of a 15-year-old boy who was stabbed to death in Huddersfield yesterday. An investigation has been launched after the teenager died in hospital following an attack close to the entrance of North Huddersfield Trust School. The head teacher says they've lost a wonderful student from their school community. Liz Truss has described Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine as a catastrophic failure in her first address before world leaders as prime minister. It came just hours after President Putin threatened to use nuclear weapons, warning he wasn't bluffing. He's calling up more than 300,000 military reservists to fight, which has sparked protests in cities across Russia. Meanwhile, five Brits captured whilst fighting alongside Ukrainians are among the ten foreign nationals freed by Russian-backed forces. Aidan Aslin, John Harding and Sean Pinner, along with two more unidentified UK citizens, had been held captive for, for months. They've been released as part of a prisoner swap brokered by Saudi Arabia. The inquest into... The inquest into the death of a woman with an acute dairy allergy who died shortly after eating a Pret-a-Manger vegan wrap is due to conclude this morning. Celia Marsh died in 2017.